All right, ladies, it is officially 1130. I do want to respect everyone's time, but I do want to welcome all of you to this new special edition of Verbally Effective. Um, we're doing a virtual platform, trying it out to see how we like it. And, you know, this is how everyone is operating right now in the digital space. And Today's series is called America's Most Unprotected and Disrespected, The Black Woman. And when I say that, I know everyone on this call can feel me right now. And um, I think that most recently we've seen just um, a lot of disrespect with women. I mean, not that it's something new. It dates back to our history, um, even with Eve and Adam in the beginning of the Bible, right? So um, it's something that is deeply embedded in our society and culture. And um, I do want to shout out uh, one of our panelists, Lita McCullough Selesky, because uh, she had tweeted an article that she had written in the GRIO um, in response to, you know, some of the backlash that Meg Thee Stallion was getting because of the entire domestic dispute with Tory Lanez and how the men was just going in on her. And it was ridiculous and uh, very disrespectful. And I said, I have to do something with this topic. And um, I was like, well, I'm going to formulate a few ladies to speak on a panel from different backgrounds and different industries about their experiences with misogyny. What is misogyny? Everyone knows what misogyny is, just to kind of sum it up, the hatred of women. And this forum we have today is not only for women, it's for men as well. I hope the men do, you know, tap in because I think that this is going to be very informative and something that all of us can gain uh, something from today because I want to hear from our panelists, our five panelists today about their experiences with misogyny and how as a culture we can definitely move forward. I'm your host, Ina Esco. I want to send a huge shout out to my producer, Sana Marie. She is on the line and you know, um, Sana, uh, her entire career is based on like race and gender. So so she knows all about this particular topic. Uh, she is a professor of sociology at the University of Memphis. So this is something that has been on our hearts and we're so excited to have you all today. So let us begin by uh, introducing our panelists today. Our first panelist is Lita mccullough Soletsky. She is on here and she is an essayist and memoirist and um, some of her work has been featured in major publications such as The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Griot, The Oprah Magazine, and she has a father-daughter memoir coming out called The Kneeling Man. She's a former guest of the Verbally Effective Podcast as well. Hi, Lita, how are you, lady? I am doing very well, and I'm so pleased and happy to be here with everyone. Thank you for joining us. She's over there on the West Coast and uh, so glad you can join us today, Lita. Also on the panel, we have one of my sorors, Jacinta Hall. How are you, Jacinta? Hello, good morning. Good morning, good morning. She is a 2005 graduate of the University of Mississippi School of Law. And currently, she is the Assistant Federal Defender in Jackson, Mississippi, an adjunct professor at the University of Mississippi School of Law. Welcome, Jacinta. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, I can't wait to hear what you got to say because you know we were painting and sipping with the AKAs a couple of weeks ago. And remember I said, I'm gonna get you on something soon. Yes, ma'am. Yes, <laughs> yes. ma'am. Yes. Up next, we have on the panel, Margaret Stout. I want to call her Stout, but I'm going to be <laughs> formal and call her Margaret Stout. That is her government name. Welcome, Margaret. How are you, lady? I'm doing well. I'm so excited to be a part of this panel with all of these amazing women. And, you know, it's an honor. Thank you. So much. Thank you, Margaret. Now, I first met Margaret uh, from doing an event we call Podbox, where uh, we were 
trying to create community with different podcasters. And, you know, that's how I first met Margaret. She's very outspoken, very opinionated, extremely intelligent. And uh, she works with, um, as a community partnership associate with a major nonprofit in Memphis. Look, I was like, oh, <laughs> yes. And a podcaster. She's working on her master's degree right now. She's the mother of two boys. Welcome, Margaret Stout. Thank you. Yes. And uh, up next on the panel, I have the stallion of politics on <laughs> the panel today. I'm talking about Tennessee State Rep for District 91, London Lamar. How are you, London? Hey, we doing well over here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join these amazing ladies. Um, yes. So I'm looking forward to the conversation, keeping it real, and it's going to be fun. Awesome. Thank you. London is actually a former guest of the Verbally Effective podcast as well, and she speaks her mind, and she is out here on the ground, on the ground working for, you know, the community in all of her efforts. So thank you, London, for joining us today. No problem. And last but not least, my girl, this is Miss Face Girl. I know a lot of you know Nikki Chanel. Hi, Nikki. How are you? Hey, Ina. I'm well. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming. She's also a former guest of the Verbally Effective podcast, and I'm sure you've heard of her brand, Face Girl brand. She has beat some of the best faces out here in the Mid-South and beyond. Like when all of the celebrities come, they're blowing up her line. And, you know, when she came on the Verbally Effective podcast, I learned so much about Nikki Chanel. Um, she has so many layers to her. And thank you so much, Nikki. You have always supported everything that we've done. And we really Absolutely. appreciate you, lady. It's my pleasure. Yes, so we are going to get started. We have quite a few participants on the line, and I've done the introductions of our panel, and this is how we're going to start it off. Um, I want each panelist to kind of walk us through your experiences with misogyny as it is related to your industry, your personal life. I'm going to give each panelist about five minutes to discuss misogyny from a personal standpoint. And we're going to start with Lita. Yes. Um, so, Ina, back when I was on your podcast in May, we talked a little bit about my experiences with misogyny. And I remember sitting there trying to parse them out and think about um, these experiences. And it was really kind of tough to come up with, you know, a lot of them outside of some of the big ones. Like we talked about how, you know, uh, when I was practicing law, getting mistaken for administrative staff or um, also in certain courtrooms, not being able to wear pants, you know, kind of big things like that. But um, as I reflected on it afterwards, I thought about why it was so difficult to come up with more examples. And the reason is because it is so pervasive. You know, it's kind of like, uh, being a fish trying to describe water. I mean, it's surrounding you. You are, it is affecting the way that you move in the world. And so it's something that we are awash in. And then also as a black woman, it, it is combined with anti-blackness. And so that operates in a very specific and particular way that is um, distinctly damaging and also dangerous and can even be deadly, as I talked about in uh, the, the Grio article. And so that's going to, you know, impact uh, your interpersonal relationships as well as institutions in the society like policing and criminal justice um, and uh, the workplace as well and our finances. And so uh, in my industry of writing and publishing, um, you know, the, it, it's there as well. And so, um, yeah, in publishing, there are very, very few Black women who are working. Mm -hmm. And so that means there are few Black women who get to decide what stories are deemed worthy of telling and um, which ones are seen as important and relevant and it it, uh, it impacts who gets to decide who tells the stories and how the narratives are shaped um, and and how much the storyteller 
gets paid, how much the story is even worth. And so um, it, it makes it a tough environment uh, for black women. Yes, yes, yes. And you know what, I never thought of it that way that, you know, in the world of publish, publishing that, you know, there are so few black women, because I know so many black women that write, but I guess when it comes to making these decisions on what gets out there, but isn't it easier now because of the digital age or no? I think that definitely that makes a difference just because now, you know, we have our own platforms to share our stories. We're not as dependent on big institutions to disseminate stories and narratives. And so, you know, we have um, social media, we have um, uh, places like Medium where we can share articles, but um, still when it comes to having those large platforms and uh, you know, the, the decisions that get made about, you know, what winds up published in major publications, what films um, are, are, are greenlit and uh, yeah. shown, then, um, you know, we've got to look to the demographics of those decision makers and black women mm -hmm. just simply are not that well represented at all. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. So thank you so much for your comments on your experiences with misogyny. Lita, up next, we are going to go straight into Jacinta Hall. Hi, I, um, and um, Lita, I was unaware of your legal background um, until you just mentioned it. And I, I thought about some of the things that you were saying. I remember when I graduated from law school that people were talking about, you know, women wearing pants and, open toe shoes even um, in court. Um, and this judge that I uh, clerked for initially, even, even in the summertime, and this was like 2005, and I love him to death. And he's a black man, but you know, his request was that we wear stockings year round, um, mm -hmm. even with <laughs> our shoes and suits. And you know, so I, I forgot about that kind of stuff until um, you mentioned it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that kind of stuff, has definitely been going on a while, but you know, my struggles as a black woman in the legal field, and you know, I practiced in Memphis until just recently um, when I left and came back to Mississippi. Um, last late last year, um, my my issues more are so with uh, the black woman aggression versus passionate. Mm -hmm. and labels and i think um ina you uh we talked about that a little bit on our um our paint and sip mm -hmm. um the labels that people put on things and and i i actually had to stop and you know explain to another black woman you know how it was when you know people call you aggressive and you know when i first started practicing in memphis around 2013 when i came in my, my style of practice was different from a lot of others that were there, you know, was more congenial uh, uh, amongst everyone else. They knew each other, they went to law school together. I didn't go to law school with um, the University of Memphis or Tennessee graduates, even though there are, are a considerable amount of University of Mi Mississippi graduates in Memphis, I didn't know anyone. So when I came in and I was about the business, cause you know, when I'm at work, like I tell people I'm at work, I'm not there, you know, to make friends. I'm there to represent my clients and get the best deal for them. I was, absolutely right off the bat oh she's aggressive you know she's mm. mean you know going down the escalators at 201 you know somebody coming up the escalator uh why don't you smile and it's just like who walks around with a smile on their face all the time right you no know, that that whole um resting bitch face if yeah. you will um you know that we often as black women get labeled as or you're angry why are you so angry and it's like i'm not angry i'm working you what? know, I represent people in a criminal justice system that is extremely corrupt and unjust. I am not going to walk around with a smile on my face, but that doesn't mean that I'm mad. Doesn't mean that I'm not good at my job, but you know, it's that angry black girl. You know, when I'm in court in speaking um, affirmatively, not even speaking loudly, but just authoritatively, um, where men are able to speak that way and they don't get labeled as such. I even mm -hmm. saw a white male get angry, throw something down and storm out the courtroom. Wow. And, um, you know, now the judge called him back, but you know, had I done that, I would have been held in contempt. 
Wow. So um, those are the kinds of just a just a little bit of the issues, um, you know, that I face as a black woman practicing practicing law. Wow. And Jacinta, since you've moved from uh, Tennessee to Mississippi, um, does it speak louder volumes in Mississippi or is it pretty much the same from a misogyny, um, you're an angry black woman type deal? It's, I mean, it's the same. I practiced in Mississippi first. Okay. So I was, I started my practice here, but it, you know, it's, it's the same everywhere. Um, you know, with the whole angry black person, if anything, the people here know me more than the people in Memphis did, uh, but the people in Memphis got to know me. Um, so, but you know, I, it was a had to get to know me situation, whereas mm -hmm. other people coming into the practice did not have to overcome that burden. And then another thing that I'm sure we'll get to later is, you know, the hair, right? I became right. natural when I was practicing in Memphis. So that's a whole different, um, you know, uh, layer on top of things, you know, how people perceive. And I, my hair, if you can't tell, is, is the kinky kind. It's not the, you know, what, as we described, that 3A or whatever hair. Yes. I, I got stuff. <laughs> so, you know, when it's growing out and it was, you know, I, I I cut mine all the way off and it was a, a, a TWA, a teeny weeny afro. And so going into court with that, you know, as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's just the tip of the iceberg on some of the issues that I've had to overcome. Oh, wow. We're definitely going to get into hair, but that's interesting. I'm glad you brought that up because like practicing in the court of law, like I, I've seen not actually in the courtroom, but like just on TV um, when it came to Black people, even men in general with, with their natural hair, how they were perceived. I, I know ain't nobody told you nothing now. They probably got you some looks, but I know they didn't say nothing about the TWA just sent them. No, they did. They didn't. Nobody came out and said anything, but I did have um, a prosecutor tell me one time, well, you know, you switch up your hair like every other day. So I had to make sure I knew who you were. So I, I, I took that completely as a joke, but mm -hmm. that just lets you know that they talk about it. Yes, 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 definitely. Well, thank you so much, Jacinta. Very informative. Up next, we are going to hear from Margaret Stout. Yeah, um, it's, it's so funny that Jacinta lift, lifted up the hair piece because I remember I worked at a law firm uh, when I was an undergrad and they that was the thing oh you changed your hair it, it, it grows so fast like I'm like miss me with the passive aggressiveness I know what this is about move <laughs> but <laughs> move but um working in nonprofit, uh it's centered around advocating for women in the community I definitely get a lot of pushback from from people because I'm advocating for women wanting more. And, you know, being a black woman in the Bible Belt, talking about how flawed patriarchy is and how we've been getting the short, shorter end of the stick. Oh, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna want you to be quiet. And it's more of, I feel like respectability politics are thrown at black women more than anyone else, you know. Um, I remember it was another uh, time I worked at, um, I'm not going to say the place, but <laughs> I was working at uh, this, this place and I had a manager come up to me and he told me, hey, do you think you can tie a jacket around yourself because it's distracting the men? Mm. And I was like, what do you, that doesn't have anything to do with me. You know, maybe right. it's, you know, I'm, you know, I'm doing me. So um, I've definitely experienced uh, misogyny in a lot of ways and as a black woman sometimes we it's either we're too aggressive or we're it's the over sexualized trope it's been times where you know i've been told oh smile for me why are you not smiling while i'm thinking i'm writing i'm on my computer not being bothered i could be working out why aren't you smiling why don't you smile baby or it'll be something as extreme as you might not want to smile at too many men because you don't want to give them the wrong idea. Wow. Like, which so is actually it? told me that. <laughs> wow. So it's like, you can't really win with it. It's just, you, you really just got to push on. So, you know, I've definitely been in um, situations where I felt smaller, even though, you know, I felt like my opinion weighed and what I had to say mattered, but because I was a woman, 
And mm -hmm. I was told a lot of times that I haven't been in my place because I have an opinion and I'm speaking up on what bothers me and what hurts me. So I yeah. think it's very important that we lift up these conversations where we talk about, you know, our comfort. If we always, as Black women, we make room for everyone's comfort, whether, you know, we're mothers, we're friends, we don't know how to say no all the time. It's no with a comma instead of right. no with a period. So I think it's important that we lift up these type of conversations. So, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Now, uh, Margaret, I, I remember just listening to you when you know you guys were doing your podcast and you were the only win woman with two men and you always had to stand your ground with these men because there was those generalizations about women mm -hmm. you know all of those things thrown at you but you handled it so well you shut them down real good you got to because a lot of times they they let it creep through with it you know how them women be wait a second hold on brother right slow it down you know so i think it's important that we have a voice that's fair mm -hmm. and honest and we we just and i'm and i'm so happy that we're getting these safe spaces that we can discuss these type of things is necessary because we have little little girls watching us and mm -hmm. you know i'm just enjoying the independence and the freeness and the the carefree black girlness that we're doing yeah. Yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you so much, Margaret. Definitely shedding a light on how some of the men can be. Okay, oh. up next, we're going to hear from our Tennessee State Rep, London Lamar. Hey, everyone. It's good to be uh, on this panel and to really be having this discussion because it's actually a really fresh discussion for me that I was just having with a close friend and a colleague, and especially for me being a politician, being the youngest black female or the youngest person in the legislature period, and being of one or three black women in the state house and one or 12 women in the state house period out of 99. Wow. So for me, um, I live, breathe and wake up every day to misogyny my whole, just every day of my whole life. Um, one, we just got to acknowledge the fact that first we must address it. People are not, used to the fact that women are coming in dominating the homes now and the workplace. It is a literal adjustment for people um, to see so many women um, being able to come out of what we consider standard general, general uh, gender roles of being in the house and um, being of a more submissive role in the professional workplace to being those who are owning it, running it, and being able to to confidently proclaim their leadership and their power and the fact that we want our checks. Um, it's hard because I want to say that misogyny um, is something I've experienced more from men, but the truth is it hasn't. I receive more misogyny and disrespect from women, especially Black women, uh -huh. um, professionally and personally throughout my whole life. Um, mm -hmm. Career-wise, Black women have been the most damaging to my career, uh, and Black men have been the most supportive. Um, personally, both of them, you know, everybody has their issues, and I experience it on both sides. Like, for men, they want to work with you. You're getting stuff done. They see you on it. They love to work with you um, and appreciate the value that a woman brings to the table until they're in the way of getting to where they want to go. Mm. So I'm good. I can be the rep in the, until they talking about making her chair this, or if it seems like <laughs> I'm going to point her to this committee over here, then it's like, wait a minute, maybe mm -hmm. I need to watch her next move. Um, and then on the other side, I just, I just can't break through the women to the point where I actually own who I am. I realized that in this role to be such a young legislator, I'm not submissive. I am very aggressive. I'm a hunter. I go out and get what I want. I don't ask for permission for nobody. I literally don't care what you think I have on. Um, and even though I take that in consideration to market myself to get what I want, you know, it's not something that if, you know, at first I used to be worried about women judging me for what I have on. And, you know, I'm tall, so my dresses sit a little bit shorter than normal people. And what, you know, when I was coming up, women used to say, well, I don't like your shoes and your legs. So, you know, I can't really get past what you're trying to say because I don't like your dress, your heels too high or this, wow. your hair is this and that. I've been told these things. 
Mm. Um, to the point where I try to now wear more suits to be less intimidating to them um, and to, you know, give the perception that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more professional or this and this and that. And so it's been really hard for me to adjust in this world to the point I just kind of moved by myself. And so I just kind of wanted to bring a different perspective to this of how women who constantly deal with misogyny every, every day end up coming to a place where we just end up advocating for ourselves and ourselves only because we don't really have any allies. I can't do anything right over here and I can't do anything right over here. Um, and so what I've come to find out is that I just treat people accordingly, but I've been really um, focused on having honest conversations with women like we have it now, because I feel like for us in order to um, ask the world to treat us equally and to treat us fairly and to treat us better, we must treat ourselves and our own sisters better before we can ask that of the world. And I'm, tr I'm trying to do that in my personal life, but even though I will say that I've been jaded, you know, from massage yeah. and I've yeah. been hurt. I've been, I feel Meg and why she was on the phone crying because you do all these things and you, and you put people, uh, you put women and men on a pedestal, especially black men and black women. And then you feel like they're the ones that's hurting you the most. And then I have to go out outside of that and deal with white men who are trying to stop me from getting things done as a legislator. And so, but I think, you know, this is the perfect time to have a conversation and I've been, I'm really intentional about bringing those to the forefront and helping us heal and get to a place where we are breaking down misogyny within our own community, especially right now while Kamala's running for office. Yes. And so I've been having to check my brothers and my sisters <laughs> on coming for the black woman. Okay. I mean, you know, and, and, and feeling like we have a right to um, drag her for every little thing when you want us to show you grace. Right. Um, and so I think that this is one of those moments where I'm using this moment in history where we're putting black, a black woman on a pedestal to do well, to show that th this is what we're talking about when we can't push our people forward because we are their biggest enemies. And so the buck stops today. We And I'm committed to defending black women all the time, black people all the time. And that's what we got to do. Yes, definitely. And you know what, London, I'm so glad you brought up the point with misogyny with other women, because it does happen women on women with misogyny. And, you know, I know that you've been the only black woman so many times in these political spaces, and you have so much to deal with. So I can understand why you feel a little jaded around there, but it looked like they not stopping nothing. <laughs> Oh, no, never. <laughs> that's good. the thing about Black women. We persevere despite everything that's put in front of us. And we will continue to do that and heal each other in the process. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much, London Lamar. Last but not least, talking about their dealings with misogyny on a personal or and professional level, we have face girl Nikki Chanel. Damn. Um, first, again, thank you for having me on the panel with all these women. I'm, this is amazing. I just want to say that to all of you. Thank you. Um, in my, in my professional world, the way, the way I deal or have had misogyny come at me with men, it comes in a, it, the attacks are very targeted towards my place in the profession. Like it's very, it's very much wrapped around classism with men and that's black or white. So if we're working on set, if we're working, um, you know, if I'm doing any type of major thing with corporate, in the corporate world, so you have to deal with all of these people. There's a lot of hands in the pot. There's a lot of chiefs, not very many Indians, but nobody can get anything done until I'm done, right? But they want to always minimize the effort, minimize the need, minimize the importance of who, you know, my team is or what we do. They always and not everybody but so often they always try to make you feel like the small man in the room but everybody up the totem pole can't do their job until my job is done and so i have to keep that in mind is that no matter what you say or how you try to approach me in this realm you still need me and i'm going to govern myself as such and i would advise everyone that's here to govern themselves as such as well because i'm still going to do my job you know so they kind of cover it in oh well you're basically i'm not the producer i'm not the director you know i'm not this that or the third but the producer and the director can't work if i don't 
get done. So you can't mistreat this group of people and expect your part of the puzzle to be great. You know what I mean? So I've learned to, I'm, I'm very much, very much an, a, a, the aggressor. Like I don't wait on a whole lot. I'm not, I don't need you to hand me anything. If I see it needs to happen, it's going to happen. And that always makes them open their eyes, but it's always down the line. It's second day of work, third day of work. When we should come in the door and you need to treat me like I'm going to treat you. Because right. your check doesn't matter to me, but mine does. You know what I mean? And everybody needs to act and understand these things. But now from on the flip side of that, misogyny towards me from women in the professional arena is always wrapped around opportunity and appearance. Always. Um, do I have, am I the lead? Am I the key? Are they reporting to me? Are they reporting to Face Girl? Why do they have to? Well, they hired me to do this job, so I'm going to do whatever they pay me to do, and you should, again, do as such. And we, as a team, can up and up and up, but a lot of people don't come in and see it that way. Or if you look a certain way, and if we're just going to keep it a buck, you know, my sister told me a long time ago, you can be too... Well, she said a different word, but you can be too okay with yourself for other women. Mm, and, I, and I don't even think I'm that confident. I think I'm, I honestly think I'm kind of gangly and awkward, but people just <laughs> like, it. I don't know. So we just go with it. But you, I don't under, I, well, I do understand why, because there's a very, very deep rooted historical background as to why we are the way we are. And nobody wants to deal with the roots. Right. We want to pick up the lead. We want to talk about the branch. Well, we shouldn't do this. We know we shouldn't do that. But if you don't get to the reasons why people do the things they do, we're going to keep doing it. You cannot legislate a thought process, right? You can pass all the civil rights bills and all the, you know, the, the criminal justice reform that you want to. But if people think a way, then so they are. They're going to vote that way. They're going to maneuver that way. London, I'm sure you know, you can see that. But I listen, you can pass every bill you got. I'm snapping, sis. I'm snapping, snap. But if they don't think it, it's never going to change. So if you think that, and if I'm taking this too far, ladies, y'all jump in and stop me. If you think, and this is from my, me personally, I fall in what I call the middle brown, right? I'm not very light skinned. I'm not, you know, super dark, gorgeous chocolate melanin goddess that I want to be, right? I'm middle brown. I got middle hair. I'm middle height. I got middle size hips, middle stomach. I'm just mid right here in the center. But when my hair is out, people treat me different. Mm. So whereas everybody I'm friends on Facebook think, oh, Nikki's doing all these great hair wraps. No, I just want y'all to stop acting away with me and I have to deal with that, which is unfair. Just like um, when Margaret said, you know, somebody came to her and said, well, can she wrap something around her waist? Her waist came with her. She didn't ask for that. Right. She right. was dropped off here with that, right? So mm -hmm. if you as also a fully functioning adult can't wrap your mind around how her body is not your property, then it doesn't matter. You're going to continue to treat them that way. and so. With women, if I look a certain way, if my hair is out, if my makeup is a certain way, and it's not everybody, you know, no, nothing is absolute, but that is where the misogyny, that is where I find women of color that I work with jumping off the boat with me onto the ship of the person who is going to put their foot on both of us. Wow. And it's very, very strange. It's very, very strange. And it's very disheartening. So you take someone like um, all of this drama with Meg Thee Stallion and uh, Tory Lane. people, women, didn't want her to say, he shot me. Mm -hmm. But he shot you. He, he asked, she didn't lie on this boy. You, we just didn't want the sister to say it. Now, we love what she's doing. She's twerking and she's cute. And oh, we, you know, you want to wave the flag, but she has a natural body. She hasn't gone under the knife, which if she wants to, girl, go ahead. That's your money. However, as soon as someone else, a man that you happen to also enjoy, did something wrong, we got to find a way for it to be her fault. Right. Because under no circumstances could he have shot your sister in the foot and you would have told her not to say anything. But this person who has accomplished something can't say anything. And it's like when you get to a certain level, even if you did the work, 
our vice presidential nominee, even if you did the work, somehow you did something wrong to get it, but nobody around you did anything wrong to get what they have. And right. that's okay. And I, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't like it. And I will keep fighting it. You know, I, I consider myself a person that can see both sides of almost anything, whether I agree with it or not. I can see kind of where you got that from that I cannot understand. I cannot understand how anybody jumps on the bandwagon of their of their oppressor because their fellow oppressed appears a certain way or you think she thinks a certain way or you believe he lives a certain way so what the same person <laughs> that was stop trying to stop them from doing it is trying to stop you from doing it they're not trying to stop you. Nobody on this panel would be trying to stop anyone from having, you know, cute hair, nice shoes, good job, blessings of the Lord, all of that. But we look similar. And somehow that comes off as an attack on my fellow sister or an attack on my fellow brother because it's ingrained in our thinking. Yeah. And until we can get below that thought process of let, let's go back to how you even started to think that this was okay. We're going to keep on going in kind of a, on a hamster wheel. And it's very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. <laughs> Nikki, you summed it up pretty well. And, you know, I didn't know that in your industry, you deal with so much, you know, even classism like that. When you get on set, how everything is breaking down once you hit the door. Like, I never mm -hmm. thought of those things. And um, something you mentioned with it being deeply rooted in our history, like yeah. that is so true, that is so true. And when you think of like, you know, your Londons, your Jacintas, everybody in, in law profession, in the political realm, what we do know about the law, it takes a long time to change something, right? Like, OMG, <laughs> like it's, one of the slowest processes ever, but hey, you know, we're trying to get to justice, but wow. And I'm glad you mentioned um, VP candidate uh, Kamala Harris, because as soon as she was announced, you know. It was disgusting. It was horrible. They dug out all of her skeletons in her closet. Some skeletons I don't even think exist, they dug them out. You know, it, it was horrible. I think they were upset they couldn't find any significant skeletons, so they just started talking. But even in that case, significant skeletons don't matter to yeah. the oppressor. Best right. example I can give of that is our current first lady and our forever first lady. Mm. Big difference. Right. She was, right? she was a, a she was putting what was it, the cover of New York magazine? She was loading the gun that mm -hmm. her husband had with the afro her arms too big mm -hmm. she right but at any every everything that they expected to for those people to be is what we have now every single right. solitary thing my son can pull up a picture of our first lady but naked anytime he feels like it true. true our former president worked for his wife she was above him like she, he worked for her he reported to her and she wasn't good enough but this person is it's right. misogyny, it's classism, it's elitism, and it is embarrassing. That's embarrassing. the best example of all of it that I could ever give. It is this it's ridiculous. Wow. Thank you so much, Nikki Chanel, for sharing your experiences with misogyny. You broke it down from A to Z, honey. And you put a lot on our mind right there, Nikki Chanel. Now at this time in our forum, I have a few questions that I would like to pose to the ladies on the panel right now. And we will have uh, questions from the participants towards the last 15 minutes of the forum. But right now, I have a few questions for the panelists. So panelists, if you would like to respond, you know, just kind of give me a clue that you want to uh, take this one up. So the first question, have you been able to confront misogyny when you've experienced it? Or how have you been able to hold people accountable for misogyny or even policies or portrayals that, that are at their core of being misogynistic? Confronting misogyny, any experiences with that? I'd like to uh, say something about that. Okay. 
um, it just reminds me of, like I said, I've been very, very open with everyone about my journey that I've been going through. Um, I got a mummy makeover for me, you know, I, you know, I just wanted to feel, you know, I just wanted to do it. Gotcha. And um, a lot of backlash that I got was, it was internalized misogyny from women. Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you must, you must don't love yourself. You must, you must be trying to get a man and, <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> but meanwhile, I just didn't want my stomach to look like bottled up. I don't work no more. Period. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, um, it's, uh, I definitely, um, when London was talking about that, I felt like that just really hit home. Um, but the only, the way that I handle mis uh, misogyny, uh, misogynistic behavior is, it's like, you can't even just address it head on where you say, hey, wait a minute, and check people because you'll be the angry black woman trope. So the only thing you can really do is just outshine them in other ways, be the best. And yeah. sometimes that, that requires working harder than, than men. That requires, you know, you losing sleep, unfortunately. You know what I'm saying? Stressing yourself out so you can be the best so people don't question you and people don't doubt you. That's the only way that I really feel like I can handle misogyny. Unless we're having like a a discussion, you know, with friends and, you know, yeah. I check them. It doesn't matter. But, you know, in the workforce, it's just the only way you can battle it is being better. Yeah. Can't address everything. Everybody's going to always have something to say. All the can I jump in? Sure. Girl, you better look as good as you want to because I'm <laughs> with it, sis. Okay, so I get it. Like, everyone knows I had a very public pregnancy fail. Um, and I get it. Like, I couldn't stand looking in the mirror afterwards. Like, I worked hard, did everything, spent money to get my body right. Because it wasn't about trying to get a man. It wasn't about all of that. It was about me feeling good as a woman. Like, I turned myself on, okay? Like, when I put on the suit, <laughs> When I, you know, get my hair done, I'll be like, I look like, damn, you fine. Yes, 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 I you feel should. good. Every day, and so twice. it's about me. And so and I want to feel good when I'm in the mirror so I can feel 10 times better when I walk in the uh, uh, committee room with this suit on, like, and what's good? You know, so okay. like, I'm with it. But from that situation, I'm here, I'm getting there now. Mm -hmm. When I was going through that pregnancy and everybody knew I wasn't married, I got caught up, single mama. I mean, they dogged my ass. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to curse. Okay. Um, they dogged me out. I mean, they talked about me. They called um, me type, all type of H words, B words. She ain't gonna pass nothing. You know, like my colleagues, some of the white women asking me, where your husband at? All of it, all of it. Like they asked me, like, Wow. And I was just like, at first I was, of course, pissed. And I don't have the luxury of popping off because I'm a black woman um, like that. <laughs> um, so I had to kind of just take it. And I'm like, and so I'm just internalizing all this criticism and all of this other stuff, all these mean things people said about me. So then when I lose my kid, all of a sudden you're like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. It's kind of like now I'm like, F you. You know, like forget you. Well, well, what they don't know is because I've owned it and from the start, and I never felt like I have to be in this box of what building a family looks like, even though some things may be easier than others to raise children. It has now become the best thing for me politically. I passed more bills than any Democrat this year based on my ability to pass legislation regarding women and families mm -hmm. and, and mothers. You know, like I'm able to, I'm moving up quickly because me owning like who I am and what I've been through and then using as hard as my story is to say it every time and using that to my benefit and taking the adversity against me and transitioning that to something positive and using it to my advantage as a legislator to continue to advocate for other women has now made me more successful than all other men and women. Right. And Republican and Democrat. Mm -hmm. So my advice is to own it. 
Like, don't, at the end of the day, they may be talking about you, but nobody respects a scared person or nobody respects anybody who's insecure or nobody respects anybody who regards of how they personally feel because of whatever personal values they have. If you don't own yours, you know, people, they probably look at me like I'm this single girl. I'm 29. I'm cute. Nice body now. You know, like they say all type of stuff about me, but I don't care. You know, like what, what I'm going to do, stop getting my check because you think something about me. And I want more <laughs> black women to have that attitude about going forth and owning who you are and understanding that people going to talk about you anyway, yeah. period. So I rather be them talking about me this way and understand you still got to come to my office and ask me to get something done. So who really got the power? Okay. Period. Period. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, um, it, it seems like, like London said, you got to own it. Like Margaret said, you got to check them regardless, like, and just be better, right, ladies? Just be better. Now, let's hit on, uh, for the sake of time, I do want to talk about colorism and um, how it plays a role and how skin tone affects how Black women in particular are perceived and treated. Who wants to hit on that? I know Nikki Chanel talked about colorism uh, when she spoke on her experiences. Okay, Jacinta. Yeah, I, I want to speak about that too, because when she said that she was a medium brown skinned sister, I was like, yes, like <laughs> I, I even tell my sister is in the beauty industry and we talk about it all the time. I'm a medium brown skinned sister with a reddish undertone. So it's like, I told her, I said, I wish I was either light skinned or dark skinned because it's like no makeup works well for a medium brown skinned person with okay. a reddish undertone. It's like my options get even more limited. Um, but and so, Nikki, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's like I'm just like a wash. Um, but uh, right. So I, there's a whole lot of things you, you can tie into the skin tone. And I'm going to also talk about the hair texture with that. Yes. So with the skin tone, I remember um, my first summer, um, I, 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 my first job I got when I was 14 years old and I worked at what used to be a water park down here in Jackson called Waterland. So um, I was not a bodyguard because I, you know, don't know how to swim, but I was in the sun working concessions. And so when school started back, like I had a tan, a tan on a, on a, on a medium, you know, uh, tone person makes you appear dark skinned. And so then there came the comments, ooh, you show black. You, and, and this is coming from us because I went to Jackson Public Schools, which were pretty much even in the 90s, not uh, very well integrated. Mm. So, you know, ooh, you got black over the summer. Ooh, you dark skinned, you know, all this other stuff. The colorism stuff, I think, though, is just like London talked about. That's a, 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 a cultural issue that we as Black people struggle with. That, to me, we have to, I've always had to explain colorism to our counterparts that don't look like us. Like, they hear us saying light skin, dark skin, but they may not necessarily know what that means. That's, a, that's an us thing. Mm -hmm. As well as, to me, a hair texture thing, that's an us thing. And I feel like, you know, for us, when we criticize or categorize each other in these categories um, that are different from ourselves, it stems from a place, especially the negativity, stems from a place of insecurity. It's like you feel a particular way about yourself and what you have. And so then you want to put me in a negative category with it. Like I talked about, you know, my kinky hair. My, my, I, my kinky hair is my kinky hair. But I hear from Black women, particularly, you know, everybody can't wear their hair natural. Everybody shouldn't wear their hair natural. And I'm like, I'm sorry. So you mean we can't wear our hair the way that it grows out of our scalp? Right. I actually said that to somebody. I was like, are you serious? So you're, you're advocating for me to chemically relax my hair so that you can feel better about how nappy my hair is? Like, <laughs> really? Right. So... Uh, that that ties into one of those things that you know we we have to deal with um with ourselves and how we see ourselves and when we find the strength in who we are as people then we won't be talking about textures of hair because i mean if, as, as my hair has gotten longer i actually prefer you know some things about my kinky hair it'll hold a style a twist out looks fine in my yes. neck 
thicker, then, you know, it may not look when it's softer. So, I, you know, I, it, it, when we start becoming more secure in who we are as Black women and all facets of the rainbow, all facets of the hair spectrum, then we can start to embrace those differences as opposed to looking upon them negatively. Yes. And I just want to add, I completely agree, because I think that's something that we have to work on in our community. And then additionally, a knowledge that unfortunately, the society has a colorism problem that they place on us. And that's what makes us insecure. It's the, like the simple fact that is that like lighter skinned women are considered more beautiful. I mean, we heard of the controversial comments that 50 Cent said on Lil Wayne's podcast about exotic and black women mm -hmm. being something he used to from the hood. Like, yeah. You know, we're constantly hearing those messages in our head or the fact that none of our greatest political leaders, and it's controversial to say this, but it is what it is, have never been completely 100% Black. Like both mm -hmm. Obama and Kamala are mixed, not full. Now we give them the Black car, you Black, period. Right. You know, but they don't look like the brown skin, you know, bad girls like me and the dark skinned women who are oftentimes put on a pedestal or when black men hit it big, they going for Kim Kardashians and the Chloe's uh, and the Kylie's of the world and not sticking with your sisters. Kanye, you want us to have your back when you have an emotional breakdown <laughs> and you know, college dropout Kanye was embracing, but now you go marry Kim and you want us to have your back? Like, no, you know, right. and like, it is what it is because like, it's, it's, it's more than just about how we feel about ourselves. It's about how colorism affects our money. The fact mm -hmm. that I know I have less likely of a chance to actually make money and be accepted if I am who I am. And right. so I don't know how to, I'm not offering a solution. I'm just acknowledging the fact that, you know, we have a colorism problem because it's actually a real thing and not just mm -hmm. among ourselves, even how the white men here see me. Like, I'm not walking up in here with an Afro. It is what it is. Like, I just can't do it. This is about as natural <laughs> as you go see me. <laughs> you know, and I, not that I don't like my natural hair. I love my natural hair. But, like, they not go look at me. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. and that matters. And that it's sexism, it's, it's misogyny, it's all of those things above. You know, Beyonce is Beyonce because Kelly dark skin. Kelly can seem way better than Beyonce. Kelly can dance just as well. But because, I mean, it is what it is. Like, yeah. you know, so I don't know how to fix it. It's, at some point, we got to hold our, of course, like Miss Hall said, hold ourselves accountable to making sure we uplift all shades of beauty of Black. Um, yeah. But also, we got to do something about how society views Black women in our shades of colorism, because the fact is, there is a value placed on how dark your skin is. Um, could I, could I uh, weigh in on this? Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I, I agree with Jacinta and London is saying, uh, are saying um, with um, Jacinta, you mentioned that um, colorism is a us thing. I do agree, but I do feel like uh, colorism is also a, the baby of white supremacy. I do. And um, I think one of the things that, I mean, especially me being a dark skinned woman in the South and having the audacity to have confidence I think uh, the audacity, uh, people will, people will put you, I, we have this weird, it's this weird thing where darker skinned women are the, are masculine, are considered more masculine. They're not considered dainty. Just like uh, when you look at the representation of a black man in the community, you will, when you think about what's portrayed in the media, it will be a dark skinned, strong man, right? Mm -hmm. He's, he's um, strong, time. he handles his business, but when it comes to the representation in media for a black woman, she's a, um, ambiguous you know woman that looks light bright you know and yeah. it unfortunately um black women we get the brunt of that you know how dare we want someone to treat us with respect we're seen as the mule that's why a lot of times i've even uh heard people say that you know the reason why they when they get on and they get with white women or other 
is because black women remind them of the struggle. They're the mm-hmm. starter chick and things like that. We've seen it with Tori Hart. We've seen it so many times, you know, and I feel like it starts with our representation, you know, not, I'm not saying it to enforce any type of respectability politics, but it's just usually when you see black women in the media, they're struggling. And yeah. it's like, I, I, I'm happy Tyler Perry is a billionaire. He is. But, <laughs> <laughs> but those black tropes, I cannot, yeah. you know, I cannot. And I think it's important that we are addressing that, uh, that colorism is a thing. I'm tired of people acting like it does not exist. It's, yes. It hurts because I didn't even find my confidence until I became an adult. You know, mm. uh, I love my father to death. I grew up with both of my parents in the home, married, but my dad was a colorist. And a lot of times, you know, you you will grow up in a household, they're married, and you're a colorist. My, I was a straight-A student. I did what I was supposed to do. My dad would come home for dinner. He would talk about those pretty little white girls at his job that were so smart. And here I am, like, <clears throat> okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I had to find out what my confidence was after I became an adult and once I found that you couldn't stop me but it will be people especially people that look like me the same view as me that will be offended about the fact that I have standards and that I think I'm beautiful and I like what I see so Mm -hmm. I think it really starts with our representation out there and a lot of times that's not really in our hands because we're not the ones that's controlling the media you know Mm -hmm. but we can, I think we're taking steps to, you know, shift that narrative, you know? Yeah. And, and let me just, let me just say something right quick, Nina, I'm sorry. And so let, let me clarify, when I say that colorism is an us thing, it's just like what you talked about, what, what you saw growing up at home. Um, and, you know, yeah, my, my dad is a dark skinned guy who married my mom, who was a lighter skinned lady. So, but when I, when I say colorism is an us thing, I'm not talking about the origins of it. I mean, right. we know where that comes from. We know how it's per, uh, perpetuated in the media and how that trickles through. But when I say it's an us thing, it's allowed, it has matriculated all the way down to us. Right. Um, you know, and we've been in this country longer than 400 years. The narrative, um, it's on, on, some, on some level, on a deeper level even, we believe those things. And that's what I'm talking about, that yeah. we have to fix within us the belief because there are mm-hmm. people in our communities that attribute beauty to lighter skinned people. And mm-hmm. we continue to allow that false narrative to perpetuate into our children. And that's why, you know, even so many years later, we're still talking about it. So no, I, I'm not at all ignorant as to the origins of it or how it's perpetuated on levels that, you know, supersede us. But, mm-hmm. but we, as a community of people, allow it to continue to go on. That's and what I, I, was gonna say really quickly. I was gonna speak yeah. to that point. Is my mic up? Yeah, to that point, exactly. Colorism and misogyny basically are are the the, you know, the, fraternal twins triplets if you throw in the classism and all of that of the mm-hmm. same piece mm-hmm. of mess right so it was given to us and we held on to it it's not going to be taken from us right you can't go back and say that was wrong for us to separate you guys like that even though it was wrong if we really want to get to it, we could have left y'all where y'all was in the first damn place <laughs> but we're here we were wrong for, it's never that, that's never going to happen it's never going to be dialed back right ever so at some point and this is one of those things that sits on both sides of the 50 yard line deeper complexion sisters are going to have to and this is not you know across the board before anybody jump on me a deeper skin deeper skin sisters are going to have to stop immediately seeing a mixed sister or a lighter skinned woman and say that that she think she better than me it's that think that get me on people ass that mm-hmm. right there if you don't know what that lady think that lady didn't say anything to right. you that light skinned lady didn't do anything to you she was minding her light skinned business and light skinned girls who have also been abused in this coloristic system are going to have to stand up for themselves but stand up for yourself the correct way because when we get done the same foot is on our neck right yeah. let us fight it out right they gonna let us fight it out and whoever's left standing well dun 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 dun, there you go or we can say hey girl they've been on your ass and they've been on our ass too what can we do 
to get forward from this thing and it's not going to be solved because my hair curls and yours lay straight it's never going to be resolved because you you get a little darker than me in the summertime it's never going to be resolved because you know my mom is super yellow and my dad is super dark and somebody thought i felt the way because of it you know it's not going to be resolved because my last name is scottish and yours isn't you know what i mean right. so we gonna have to own this baby we're gonna have to own this baby because again you cannot legislate a thought process and to be perfectly honest if you're not a rich white man you are a nigga in uh. this and people don't get that right so if the niggas of this country will step up and say okay you know what that's just dumb and we're not going to accept it anymore. that's just stupid we're going to do better. We're going to be what we talk like we are. You know, we're going to actually make it be something instead of talking like it's something. And it's going to keep on happening. And we're going to keep on fighting it out. And they, not us, but them, going to keep on doing what they have been doing. It is not across the board. Some people do carry on those stereotypes. And some people do reside in that negativity some people can only thrive in that space where they feel like something that they've had no control over that came into their lives makes them better than something that somebody else has no control over it's not going to solve itself but we're not talking about you it no good in america isn't gonna be no damn good in wakanda so everybody can't go with us right it's, right. it's not gonna cover everything but at some point we're gonna have to say you need to hold my hand and i'm gonna hold your hand and we're gonna do this because it's us Right, right, it's going right. To have to happen because it's never gonna be dialed back. It's the misogyny, the elitism, which I deal with a lot more than I deal with elitism more than I deal with misogyny, and that's a whole nother panel. But uh -huh, all of those, panel. those toxic babies that have been gifted to us that we've been taking care of, gonna have to grow up and get out. Right, and before we pass eighteen, y'all need to get a job and go away. We we have to fix this. We have to fix this for ourselves because no one's gonna dial it back for us. They're just gonna keep throwing it at us and say, "Look at what they do." Wow. Because now, for the sake do. of time, for the sake of time, I'm sorry to interrupt, Nikki, but for the sake of time, um, it is twelve thirty-one. This Zoom will shut off at approximately twelve forty-five. But I do want to take a few questions if you guys can stay on the uh, the platform until 1245. I do want to get questions. If you have questions, participants, go ahead and put it in the chat for us. And um, I'll get into that. But I do want uh, Lita to uh, get her thoughts on colorism out there before I go to the participants questions. Yeah, I just wanted to say really quickly, you know, um, I think that it's important for us not to shut down these conversations. I'm so glad that we're being so transparent and openly talking about it because so often I hear it, especially from light skinned people, you know, who don't want to acknowledge that they have benefited from colorism. And, you know, I can tell you that I, I've seen it operate. I know that I've benefited from it and I don't like to see when people try to kind of all lives matter the situation and say, oh, well, we're all black at the end of the day, you know, this is divisive. Um, I think that that does a lot of harm. And I think that, um, you know, I don't have the answers, but I do know this. I do know that in order to address it, we must confront it and be honest about it. And, um, you know, as others have said, um, be accountable and take responsibility. And I think it does, much of it does start from within and, um, you know, confronting it within our community and raising consciousness about it um, and opposing it every time that we see it and not perpetuating it. Definitely, definitely. Now I'm looking in the chat, trying to see if we got any questions from our participants. Uh, a lot of statements. I don't really see any questions right now. Uh, great points, ladies. Uh, people often confuse confidence with arrogance, particularly if we're talking about a Black woman. Uh, Jay Hall, you are correct. This happens to me daily. Confidence is so often confused with arrogance. Um, anywhere the colonizers set foot, the people were taught to be ashamed of who they were. Not just Black people, Hispanic people, Asian people. Colorism is a false narrative to make us feel inferior. 
Wow. Okay. Since I don't have any questions from the uh, participants that I see on here, I do want to leave it to the panel to, I guess, give their final thoughts if they would. And I, and I know that they've been talking for an hour and probably have already, you know, kind of gauged where they stand with misogyny. But if you could give maybe like, give me a minute each about, you know, your firm beliefs in how we can combat misogyny and how we can move the culture forward. Let's start with Lita and go down the line. How we can combat misogyny and move things forward. I think um, when I think about misogyny and misogynoir in particular, I think that we kind of have to look at it the way or the way that I look at racism anyway, and I look at misogynoir the same way. It's not enough to not be misogynistic. We have to be anti-misogynistic. So that is um, something that takes intentionality. It takes um, actively opposing misogyny wherever we encounter it. And so, um, you know, many of the things that we talked about today, um, London, you know, in the legislature or, um, you know, in the nonprofit realm uh, or in uh, the, the uh, defender's office, I think there are so many arenas where we're going to be confronting misogyny in all of its different manifestations. And so, you know, we've got to oppose it. We've got to oppose the policies, but we've also got to oppose the thinking and the mindset. Um, as Nikki uh, had brought up earlier, you know, as we think, um, so we become. And so I think that, you know, it's, it takes work. It's, it's yeah. a daily practice and it's, um, it's, it's a lifelong process. There are no easy answers. It's going to take work. And I think, you know, there's so many venues where these battles are fought and will continue to be fought. And so that's what we engage in every day. Um, and so, uh, you know, in all these different fronts, I think there is space for all of us to use our talents and our gifts and our platforms to, to battle it. All right. Yes. Okay, Justin. So, what are your final thoughts? Um, final thoughts. Um, basically piggybacking off of what Lita said. To me, it's in it's in the hearts and minds of of our people. Um, and when I say our people, I don't even just mean us. Just opportunities. Um, when it comes, uh, to explain or to just have heartfelt conversations with people. Um, you know, being aware of labels that even we use, you know, like uh, aggression and, and passionate and, you know, what we assign those labels when we, when we say, oh, somebody's being so aggressive, uh, what are we really meaning by that? Um, you know, and, you know, why do we choose to use that label aggressive towards someone who is passionately advocating for whatever it is that they want? Um, I always like to seize opportunities to kind of probe with people when I hear those kinds of things, you know, and a lot of times people don't even think about it. They're just repeating and, you know, just going by rote on what they've heard and how they were raised and how things have always been. But then when you bring awareness to something, even in a private setting, like, hey, why did you say that? Why do you think I'm aggressive or why do you think she's aggressive? Is that a bad thing? You know, why that word choice? Even when you do just that little bit of probing, it gets people to thinking about those things. And then when it comes up again, they may be more conscious. Okay, I understand why she asked me that, or I understand why, you know, that's labeled that way. And I think that, you know, it really truly, you know, it, it begins at home, you know, with the people yeah. that we love the most um, and having conversations in the workplaces when COVID allows us to go back to workplaces like we had been, you know, to really just kind of probe and see, you know, and try to, you know, affect change that way to just like Margaret said, to show something different, you know, to, to, um, to not necessarily, you know, try to advocate or speak or argue someone into changing their minds, but to just show them, you know, like the Bible, you know, talks about being differently, being different, showing different, you know, I'm not going to, you know, just tell you I love you, I'm going to show you. So I'm going to show you, um, you know, that how good I am and why that stereotype should not apply to me. Um, so uh, those ways, I think, are ways that um, we can affect change um, and misogyny in um, concerning Black women. Thank you so much, Jacinta. Margaret Stout. <laughs> um, yes, I feel like we can combat misogyny by rejecting what we know 
is harmful. Victim blaming, um, just and having open, honest dialogues with people. And one of my things that I try to do is I'd rather talk to someone that's on the fence and wants to at least interact than someone that's gung-ho on trying to, you know, have a rebuttal to anything. And they're not, I'd rather have someone that's kind of like, okay, I'm willing to listen and we can agree to disagree. At least I know that you're open for a change. You know, um, we need to uh, call, call things out. You know, R. Kelly is not all that for you to see a heavy in your, you know, playlist. I mean, you could, I mean, it's not that crucial to step in the name of love. Call it out. Stop holding these people on the pedestal and understand that you need to, pr in, order, in, in order to protect our community and have our, uh, our village become a village, we have to call out the bad apples and we, and we have to stop defending harmful blackness because it's blackness, you know? Yeah, I think that will help a lot. But yeah, that's my take. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. London Lamar. London Lamar. Yes, second cancel this cancel culture. You gotta go. Oh. Um, and so I love that you said that. But first and foremost, thank you so much for inviting me on this panel. It's thank been you. great. The ladies I'm on this panel with, each and every one of you all are amazing women. Yes. And I just want to continue to encourage you and uh, love on you despite the things that we go through. You are so valuable. Um, but for the most part, I feel like, you know, in my role, I want to continue to check myself. And as again, I start this panel saying we got to check ourselves as, uh, as women and black women on how we treat each other, but also continue to check the world and how they respond and treat black women in their everyday conversations and how they paint us in the media and the news. Um, and so I want to say I'm commit committed to doing that as a legislator. I'll continue to please elect more women to the state house. Um, so I can have some help to defend this misogyny. I'm just really just walking through it. But if I can get more women on my side, I can really break down those barriers. So help me um, by going to the polls and voting for more Black women into office. And let's get our girl, personally, I'm telling you, not official endorsement from any other entity, <laughs> but London Lamar is asking you to please exercise your right to vote and make a Black woman the first Black woman, female, Vice President of the United States. Let's do that for hey, our women. That sounds good. That sounds real good. Okay, last but not least, Nikki Chanel. Take us out, Nikki. Okay, let's let's <laughs> let's let's put this in a cute little ball and wrap it up. I think the oppressor isn't gonna do it, right? And for lack of a better way to put it, you know, misogyny, misogyny noir, especially because that's kind of the only thing that black men can say, okay, we're up here on. You know what I mean? Like everything else, they down here with us. But when they feel, when they, it's not conscious normally, but when they feel like they can separate themselves somehow, and I get it, I get the historical reasons, fine, but we got to end it. They're not going to end it on their own. We are going to have to motivate them. And the way to motivate them is through the feminine through the female, through the woman. We are the only thing, species, way possible to make them act right. Train these young girls, teach these young ladies what is not okay, what you don't have to take, how you can get up and go somewhere else. And when I speak to that narrative, I get the, oh, but you a man hating this and you, no, 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 no. I can, I'm, I'm a, you know, an educated woman who can conjugate a subject and a verb. You know, it's not about hating you. I can think, right? I can, I, I can think, I can see. If we can get these young ladies to say, no, sir. If we can get them, you know, a, a, a larger majority, and it only takes one person to spark that flame. Look at when Kobe passed away, the whole world shifted. The yeah. one right young lady who 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 is just hell bent and, and fervent about this is not okay could spread to everybody else. If we get the women, ladies, females, girls to not accept it, the men, males, the fellas will eat will start to come out of it. True. They're going to go the way that the women force them to. But we have got to get our ladies, our girls to understand that it's not okay. It was more girls coming at Megan the yeah. way you know, negatively than it was men. You know, I think we call them pick me. That is, 
hey, if we can get the women, we can get it to stop. Talk to your daughters, talk to your nieces, talk to the little girl down the street. When you talk to these young girls, that will stop it. That will stop it. You can measure a civilization by the way it treats its women and its children, and that's what's going to change this thing. Wow, you said that, Nikki. <laughs> <Chanel. laughs> <Look>, period. <laughs> Y'all, I want to thank all of you for participating today. I do have to kind of close it out because it will cut off in about a minute, but this is actually recording. So I will post and tag you all on all platforms on the YouTube. But thank you to my panelists, Lita McCullough Zaletsky, Jacinta Hall, Margaret Stout, London Lamar, and Nikki Chanel. I have enjoyed you ladies you all were phenomenal you gave so much awesome information and i just want to thank you once again and i'm gonna be calling y'all for some more virtual so answer the phone thank you <laughs> bye ladies everybody thanks for having me y'all have a good day everybody thank you bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.